and gentlemen, here we are, and it's uh, Friday afternoon. It is. Yeah. So, Dan Rose, how are you, sir? Uh, you know, I, I, all but the rash. It's been acting up. Outside of that, I'm good. Okay, always something. Yeah. It is. <laughs> you need it is. to get that looked at. I think it was what you said last time. I should. I, uh, you, I've so. just been posting pictures of it, of it on Facebook and asking people if they think it looks infected. I'm like it's not it's not helping. <laughs> so glad you're here, regardless of all the medical complications. I did have, have a vet who's a friend of mine look at it and say it was distemper. Uh, okay, I don't <laughs> a vet and a friend and distemper. Okay, <laughs> it's, it's. well somebody needs to do something about that. So I got actually, so. my vet friend also said I should be fixed. I don't know what that means either. Yeah. It's, well, it's we've, we've thought of that. <laughs> we, we've uh, we've come across that just a little bit. I want to make some adjustments along the way, but here's what we're doing today. Mm -hmm. We're just talking about things. Um, you, you, you had an idea. You, you you had an idea of something. Yeah, I, there was I something mean, that um, was, um, you were well, thinking of me, and then you thought of this topic. Well, no, uh, um, but yes, in a way, <laughs> because it was something we might discuss. Because this um, person I was listening to uh, was talking about that we are all selfish. That selfish. We're within our. Mm. Uh, we are self-centered in some mm -hmm. in some way, but we have our yeah. perimeter is all about us, mm -hmm. and that it takes a lot of work to engage outside of that perimeter sometimes. And um, that just got me to this point where we were talking about being. It's unfortunate selfish. because I thought you said something else, and I thought I'm allergic to that. I thought you said shellfish, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, we're going to talk about like I was going to talk about some allergies, but also selfishness, and we're all selfish. Well, I think so in a certain mm -hmm. way that, that we have to be somewhat. Well, let's back up for a second. If you talk about um, self psychology, which you've talked about, I do. I, dad, I, I, one, dad, one of my first loves, self psychology. And so, um, one of the things that we have to to know about at some point as we live our life is sort of explore what goes on internally, who we are, define mm -hmm. who we are, our value systems, our beliefs, mm -hmm. our thoughts, and how to manage things. As mm -hmm. we've talked about many times on this show, so um, I'm just curious about that. Are we selfish? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? And I think that's a, that's where we're going. Today that's, that's a good thing. Topic. It's good. Well, you mentioned self psychology because you know the way self psychology talks about this is that the self is sort of a um, it is something uh, you can sort of define the we have to define the self and from a self psychological perspective there is um there is the brain and then there is the mind and the mind is an emergent property of the brain okay. and the self is a system that it's an emergent property of the mind in context with other selves so there's there are sort of layers to this when you talk right. about self from a self psychological perspective it is um, it is in, in the self system requires constant maintenance. We have to be able to do something with ourselves. We have to maintain. Uh, Coa talked about um, it has to have um, rigor. It has to stay cohesive. Right. And so we there are all these ways that we manage our self states to maintain some level of cohesion. And sometimes right. to manage those self states, we have to be selfish. And that's right. when we are using the people around us to help us as self objects. They, and they can serve different purposes. There are um, what he called mirror self objects, where people uh, will reflect back to us things that we need to see. Idealized self objects, we have to people we have to look up to. They need to be ideals that we move toward. Twinship, where we can see that there we have a lot in common. Um, there are a couple of others too, but these are all ways in which we can sort of make use of the people around us to maintain some form of self cohesion. To feel um, and cohesion can be defined as a right. sense of who you are across time. Okay. Right. Some consistency of who we right, are. Yeah. So we wake mm -hmm. up in the morning, mm -hmm. uh, we know about our history, who we were. Right. Before. We can feel, and that throughout the day, we're often generated what are known as not me states. Parts of us that are parts of us, but we're, um, at Lacan would call them extimate. They are part of us, but they feel external or they feel alien to who we are. And so those also have to be managed. And they're often managed through projection or projective interjection, like, you know, like, um, 
you, um, you don't want to acknowledge some of your own anger. Instead, you'll see it in the eyes of someone else. And that's a way of also managing this self-system. and this. Right. And I think, yeah, th- that, that seems to be the issue of how we manage this and, and sometimes project onto other people or we see something reflect back in us. Uh, we can't manage that. We'd rather project it out. It's too much for us to sort of manage. And also anger. I mean, we have to, if you're selfish, you want it your way. You want it to have things go in a certain way. Mm-hmm. When it doesn't, I mean, that sort of leads that selfishness is a step toward anger in some way, mm-hmm. is it not? Mm-hmm. And you, know, you think of, um, like, if you think of uh, uh, in the popular media, the idea of the narcissist, and that is somebody who is selfish, someone who is um, um, uses others. Um, um, uh, narcissism is a stuck form of self-cohesion it's like this individual doesn't have a flexible way to be able to maintain a sense of self across time so they are stuck and there's often an anger component to that like uh, there's a saying uh, i think i may have said this back somewhere in the past when we were talking but um there's a saying that there's no such thing as a uh, narcissist alone in a forest that it takes two to generate narcissism so often someone who is exhibiting narcissistic traits has uh, uh, there's been an impingement there's been a drop there's been something in their environment that's affected them in some way and they manage the pain the self dysregulation by engaging in some activity usually the puffer fish they suddenly make themselves bigger right mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. for instance not to get political but some folks would say that our president exhibits some narcissistic traits. It's been said on uh, many occasions. It has and been As a matter said. of fact, we, we had an entire show devoted we did, we did, to that. We started to dance around the diagnosis pretty well in that yeah, one. We did, we did. No, but no. since that time, I, if I may add, it's come out in various ways with various licensed yes. people talking we about it. We were the first. We well. were the first. <laughs> we may yes. have been, yes. That's but, true. Um, <laughs> um, you'll notice how he manages it. Oftentimes when he feels attacked, if his... Um, if his character has been impinged in some way, he suddenly says, I'm the most honest person in the world. Or he goes to, I'm great. He And that's the puffer fish. You think of a puffer fish suddenly makes itself bigger to scare off predators. That's what the narcissist can do sometimes. And they suddenly get bigger as a way. And that's that's a way to manage that self-system. And, and maybe that's a form of selfishness, I'm not sure, but um, it certainly would feel that way, right? Right, it mm-hmm. absolutely would. I don't want to go too far off um, uh, from what we're talking about, but but uh, the narcissist, um, where does that come developmentally? Is that some, some trauma that happened earlier? What, what's the general census on how you do become the narcissist mm-hmm. uh, in this day and age? It's funny because if you look at because that technically is a personality disorder, and a lot of the research would suggest that there's a continuum, and there's a point at which personality disorders become so pronoun- pronounced that there's certainly some significant trauma and maybe some uh, genetic or biological components need to be thought about. But from Kohut's perspective, um, uh, narcissism, and even some of the other thinkers in psychoanalytic thought like Kernberg and whatnot, there is some sort of developmental trauma. There is something that the individual didn't get, and you can think of it this way. Narcissism is a solution to a developmental trauma. This They have adapted and become the best they could be to be able to navigate and negotiate some very difficult points early in their life, and they get stuck with it. So uh, Freud called it making the best of a bad job. That's kind of what it would be. Mm-hmm. Um, and Coet would say that uh, all of us begin as um, a reflection in our, in our mother's eye. So we have to find mirrors in our life to reflect back to parts of us that we can begin to own and integrate a self. Okay. So uh, this person is really trying to do the best they can with trying what they the have at this, yeah. at this point. On the other hand, back to selfishness, that's a big component of the narcissistic. I have to be the center of attention. Mm-hmm. Everything has to go my way. I won't tolerate anybody else being better. Mm-hmm. I can't accept any help mm-hmm. uh, in some yeah. ways. And so I think mm-hmm. a lot of that uh, is about self sort of just just really blown out of proportion like you talked about the puffer fish but that's exactly what happens it goes way beyond what a normal person in a relationship could could tolerate if you're the other person for mm-hmm. example and like we, we said that because 
if we think about if there's such a thing as healthy, which would be me. Uh, right, got it. <laughs> yeah. That uh, several people, including both my wife and my mom, would disagree. Yeah, there's a there's a long list. I could give you a <laughs> hey, longer probably, list right, if you like. Yeah. But that's Everybody okay. knows. Fine. Me. But We're, God, He's also you, like okay. this. They're going, yeah, you're I doing the best you can. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> there is um, what I like about Coet is Coet says that there is a healthy form of narcissism that um, we do have to find ways to to uh, uh, aggrandize to puffer fish at times. And so there is a window of narcissistic behavior that could be acceptable, you know, that uh, that would be okay. You don't get stuck. Like you can think um, if you come home and it's been a long day and your wife says, uh, you know, um, hey, you forgot to take the trash out again and now we're this is the third week in a row the trash is built up. And mm-hmm. um, you suddenly may feel, uh-oh, um, a sense of I suck, I'm a lousy husband once again. And maybe there's a lot of things during the day that made you give that feeling. At that moment, you might puffer fish. You might be able to say, you know, and you might do it immediately. Or you might find yourself telling your wife how many people today complimented you on your shoes. And all of those (laughs) are... Anything that sort of move away. (laughs) But it also generates, and we do that. And and One of the things when I work with, um, with, uh, with... uh, mental health professionals, when we talk about narcissism, I often ask them as part of the the, the to after uh, to to look for after we talk about this, when they're hanging out with friends, hanging out with family, look at the way the people around them uh, manage narcissistic injury, and if somebody comes and sits down and starts telling everybody about their the trip to Greece that they have planned and how great it's going to be. Some people will receive that with no problem at all, but you'll see some of them are like, there'll be envy into the room. And you can literally see right. how a group of people navigate this this impingement. And uh, not pathologically, I mean, I guess it's possible if somebody gets a fork in the eye or, uh, you know, right. if somebody, you suddenly call someone a whore and throw a chair, something like that, that can happen. Right, right. But, uh, never, uh, never know when I call that Thanksgiving out. in my house. That's what it's but, uh, like. But, uh, Thanksgiving, I got but, it. But uh, you, um, you or they can, come back with the idea of my I got a better vacation. Right, there you than go. You. See, yeah, you know, that and that's kind of thing. literally a moment when someone is attempting to, to to moderate and navigate that impingement. And so there are literally, you know, hundreds of impingements that we may incur throughout the day. And Facebook, it's interesting. Yeah. It is truly, I think, um, sped up the the number of impingements. I don't know about you, but I'll I'll I. Uh, I have a friend who I went to high school with who travels all the time, and I'll suddenly look, I'll turn my Facebook on, you know, and I'm thinking I'm having a great day, and he's like, you know, in Dubai, and there's a picture of him, you know, you know, um, half naked holding a coconut or something. I'm like, right. what the, you know, like what the, <laughs> and and my first response, and it's often unconscious. It's not like I am, you yeah. know, I, but I I'm suddenly, a, what's I'm like, with yeah, me? I'm a loser. <laughs> I just suddenly start guy, feeling I bad. I get irritable, you know, and. Those impingements are just rapid fire in a face of, of um, s- uh, social media and connection. And I think we often, social media and that level of connection has moved faster than we've been able to adapt in some ways. And right. it's, if you'll I mean, notice, sure. particularly the self that people tend to uh, show on Facebook is truly an inflation. I mean, there are people who have a depressive characteristics that will show pictures on Facebook. I'm depressed. I hate myself. You see that sometimes. Sure. Those are more depressive than. But lots of folks is they literally they edit and they show a part of themselves. You know, there's there's always them right. holding a coconut half naked. You know, they're standing in front of their their new um, um, Tesla right. uh, or whatever right. they got. Right. You know, got, got, and yeah. so all of those you know are, are 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 ways to manage. And I guess in some ways you could think of them as they're certainly selfish in the sense that they are focused on the self in a way that is not that what they're hoping from the other right. from the other cells that watch is some form of praise some form right. of 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 mirroring and Cole would say that that those right. the, when the, on Facebook we want the world to be mirrors that reflect back how cool we are you know? wow and um, I, I would assume sometimes that you don't get that so I get that. It, that I well, never get that. No, I know. <laughs> you should, and that's so, that's a hint. You should really be uh, should be saying some nice things about. Well, I know, but if you don't get it, you have to create it yourself. 
right? So you find ways in, in every interaction almost, it seems like, for the narcissist, as we talked about, that's, uh, it has to be immediate, has to be continual, has to be something that is uh, always inflating the ego. Well, what's the problem with the narcissist is often it takes, and, and Koa talks about this too, that there is a, um, and this connects with some of Alan Shore's work, that a narcissist is attempting to avoid a, um, and this connects what we talked about last week, the attempting to avoid a tidal wave of shame. Right. And in a shame state, in what are, what Coet called narcissistic disintegration, there is an implosion of the self. So you're trying to avoid literally imploding, and that's kind of what happens with shame. You sort of just sort of become a, a black hole. But and, it's not a small amount. It's a tidal wave. Right. It's a, you're expecting something very uh, big and horrible and may disintegrate. It. He calls it somewhere. annihilation anxiety. That there, that the the act of implosion of the self was, you know, it, it, it is it is a tidal wave of annihilation. And so, the narcissist reflexively, desperately and reflexively, moves to whatever state they can to be able to avoid that. And it often can be a form of narcissistic rage. You know? And I think one of the things you often see, say, in serial killers, Ted Bundy thinks a wonderful example of sort of this pathological or malignant narcissism. There's actually a term for that. Where others may, um, may deride, maybe, uh, maybe use people in a selfish manner. Someone like Ted Bundy uses them in a selfish and sadistic manner. And so they literally could put all of their shame into someone else and humiliate them and sadistically torture them. And for a brief moment, it cleans the slate. It generates in them this this sense of balance, and that's why with folks like Ted Bundy, you would you would um, they might kill and they might not kill for a while, but then they then they go back into this into this sort of predatory stance, finding some sort of container for all the things in themselves they can't own. And um, right, it's always outside too. Mm-hmm. It's always the other person. And you know what? What seems to be missing with this, and besides just the levels of it, uh, that seem to be extreme in lots of ways, um, it, it's it's the lack of empathy, the lack of connecting mm-hmm. connecting with another person with outside. So this selfish mm-hmm. notion that we talked about from the very beginning is sort of some um, uh, um, model for mm-hmm. our, our 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 self that doesn't connect with others. Mm-hmm. I'm just I'm just wondering, is it a cure for some of this? Maybe some empathy? Well, that's uh, Coet's whole therapy is based on mirroring and a form of empathy. For instance, if um, the narcissist, and again, that's going to be someone who's in the most extreme range of this, if, um, if they can get the right mirrors and they can say, have someone help them to connect with the shame, then they can come up with another way to do something with it. So to be able to say, you know, when the guy talks about going to Dubai and shows you the picture of a coconut and all that sort of stuff, right. you can say, you know, right now you feel ashamed, you feel less, you feel worthless. When, when this happens, you can really feel everything that you built up just slip away from you, and you may be desperate to try to hold on to it in any way you can. So it's this almost uh, defense against disintegration mm-hmm. and not allowing yourself to sort of feel that mm-hmm. and understand it and not be overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. Well, th- th- there's, there's actually, it may be, there's a wonderful title from a, a book by uh, Mike Epstein called uh, Going to Pieces Without Falling Apart. Okay. So the like goal the is yeah. is how to be overwhelmed in the right way. So to go to pieces but not fall apart. So you can say yes. And remember we talked once before about this notion of the three yeses. And the first is to acknowledge what you feel. I feel shame. I feel a sense of worthlessness. And then once you've been able to, to name that, then you can own it. This is me. And then there's the possibility of doing something else with it. And to do something else with it would be to... To, um, to, 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 I mean, it, it can be as simple as being able to be aware of, wait a minute, who am I? Where am I at? Um, count the people who love you. Um, there are all sorts of ways to orient yourself and fix yourself into a reality that's actually kind as opposed to the warped reality that comes from this desperation, this fear of annihilation. Yeah, and this desperation leads to the anger with others when things are not going your way. 
as you predict, that everything is going to go your way. And so the ability to actually look at yourself and admit that maybe you're not all of that, maybe you have some flaws, maybe you have, you've done some things that are not up to speed or you mm -hmm. there's something you can do better uh but it doesn't seem like that's even in the ballpark well there's this wonderful guys. meme and it's got a picture of a dude and it says um uh the universe doesn't give a crap and then there are two 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 sides of it and right. then there's the guy screaming no and then there's this guy <laughs> going great and so there is something liberating liberating about not being all that to be well, able to say you know what it's okay to just be okay because it's exhausting to try to be something else other than that. Well, um, I think that that really is a, a, a part of a big part of this problem is the energy and effort that a person like that has to p continually day to day, every day, all day, um, pump themselves up and not be able to sign a take a break and just sort of relax from it and say, okay, well, I got problems too. Mm. Other people got have problems. Mm -hmm. I guess mm -hmm. we're some, I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm okay. Well, there's Those this uh, kind of ideas. It, 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 when everything seems relatively simple, it's important to, to go to a theoretical model. It's even more difficult to understand. So I think it'd be great to We've go to Lacan. There for <laughs> One of the things I like about Lacan is Lacan, he has this, this idea that we go through what's called a mirror stage. And there's a point at which we literally learn what the world expects of us, and we're sort of trapped by it. So the mirror, as opposed to something that helps us own parts of ourselves, is something that we get stuck in. So, um, and he uses a wonderful example that before you're born, you're given a name. You didn't choose it. So literally, so the whole concept of a self, and in this way he sort of lines up with Buddhism, is a trap. And that the fact that we have to manage it gives us an indication that it is a trap. And so his way through it is to be able to accept that everybody is flawed. We are all broken. There is a, a rivenness. There is a, a void that, that is part of all of us. In fact, in some ways, it's the very thing that makes us a subject. Animals don't have self-states. They don't have personality. They may have, but they don't have self-states. They don't. They're not conscious in that way. Right. Maybe, maybe not, but that will be the... the that, 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 that's actually a, a, a good idea for another show. <laughs> it is, it is. To talk Big, about yeah. how, how far... Are we the only ones with consciousness? Well, but I don't want to take you off the, the task. What Lacan would say is that if you'll notice, like um, if a dog wants to eat, you can, you can open up a can of food and put it in a plate and the dog's fine. If we want to eat... We have to choose a restaurant, choose who we're going to eat with. We put clothes on. We make all this ritual. We literally, it is embedded in this huge cultural process. And that that in of itself is, and all of culture, is an attempt to paper over the fact that we are riven and there's a brokenness to us. And right. so Lacan's way through this would be able to say, you know, the universe doesn't care. Um, you are not all that. Nobody's right. all that. Right, um, right. It was, there's a famous Lacan quote that um, there's nothing crazier than a king who thinks he's a king. Because a real king knows that I am only in this position because this is the society I was born into. I am somebody holding this place because all of the things around me have set it up to be so. And... When the soon as the king, if he buys into the fact that he actually is a king, if you saw the 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 um, um, the movie, the king's speech, it's right. literally about this guy. This guy was taking his kingship so seriously that he, it it literally tripped him up. When right. he was able to move through this and put it in some sort of perspective, he was able to speak. And so the goal is for all of us, like um, uh, the only thing crazier than a um, than um, um, a, um, a husband is a husband who believes he's a husband. Every single, every, every mark we carry to some degree is simply embedded in a context. And if we take it too seriously, we move, we move into, uh, into a bad space. Well, that certainly sounds like the, uh, the narcissist and the person who is very <clears throat> selfish. Can, you be, can the average person just be selfish with some things? And is that a balance? Is that a part of life that I need to negotiate how I deal with others in the culture and, and that kind of What's society? Funny. And also take care of myself. Because I, I talk about this with patients sometimes. Because I like to think that there are three sort of potential stations. There is... Um, Selfish, 
they're self full and they're selfless. Oh. And in some ways, they're sort of points along the and um, uh, selfish. That is when you uh, relate to someone as they have, they simply have a use to you. You have no sense of the other. They're a part object. In mm-hmm. the selfless, you yourself, in a way, become a part object. You become something that you give away. You become a use for someone else. And they both have, they both have places. Right. Sure. If you are, if you come home and you've had a really hard day and you're tired, and you simply want your spouse or whatever to be able to listen to you, in a way, that is a selfish space, but a healthy one. Um, we talk about this um, in, um, in, in psychology thought. Every time I look at the watch and I know I have to end the session at 10 till because I have to use the bathroom, right. because that's what we do, that is what's known as positive hate. I'm saying, screw you, get out of here. It's now about me. i got to have this time. I don't think I've ever heard <laughs> those two phrase, those two terms together, but uh, that makes sense in a Posit- way, does it and not? So, yeah. so a, a, a non-pathological or healthy use of being selfish is this notion of positive hate. Boundaries require you, at least in a minimal way, to say, screw you. They do. And um, self-care demands it. On the other end, selflessness um, there are moments when that's both helpful if you have a child, if you have someone you love, to jump in to try to save someone drowning, all these sorts of things. Mm-hmm. But that also could be pathological. That in, can also be sort of an, uh, an inverted narcissism. You literally are finding your own sense of self-worth by giving yourself away, and that's just a shadowed form of narcissism. Okay. That in of itself is pathological. Okay. It's the middle point I often talk about with patients, and I talk about the notion of being self-full, and that is about self-care. And in some ways that requires a, a reflective function. What do, does myself need? What do I need to do? And this involves a little bit of, of, um, of positive hate as well. Um, uh, right now I could stay up and do this, but I need to sleep because I have a long day tomorrow. Mm-hmm. That is an act of self-fullness. It doesn't have with it the sense of um, of uh, of the other as part objectified. It, it is it is balancing an equation for you. You right. want to be able to think about like you know uh, taking days off, um, eating a good meal, setting out and, f- and getting a little bit of sun for five minutes. Um, we have this campaign. Uh, we've been talking it over at the center that sitting is the new smoking, and so. What do we, to be selfful is to get up every 45 and 50 minutes and walk for three minutes, right? Okay. So, boom, that's a selfful act. But to be able to get people to talk about this middle point and to be able to think about it, I would uh, I would advocate self-fullness, you know? Yes, and and the idea that, that maybe um, yeah, we have to get to this level. We, uh, in so many ways, we've talked about this many, many times, the idea that you have to be s- reflective, you have to think about your thoughts you have to be aware of the kind your as best you can your emotions and what's going on with you and how it re- interacts mm-hmm. with the environment with other people mm-hmm. it just seems that that's almost the first step in all of this well i, I think you know you, you have that that yes this is what i feel and somewhere in there is the possibility of being to be curious about who you are and i like that concept of curiousness if you can be curious of you know someone who's trapped in this narcissistic cycle if they can become curious why is it that i get so upset when this happens why is it that i say the things that i do why is it that i do these things as soon as you open that possibility of curiousness they can begin to think about themselves in the world slightly different whenever i do couples work for instance oftentimes the couples are locked into this state of part objectifying each other and they'll and you can always tell when it's, you, you notice. You always tell them what's going to happen when they use the words like "never" and "always." Yes. Like you, you never do this for me. And I always, some to some pay, if I've been working with them, I can be joking about it because that's miraculous. If they never do it, I mean, to never—that's a level of superhuman consistency. <laughs> you know, it's really, impossible. you should you should give them an award. But it seems like it's <laughs> almost an attempt to make the point even more right. or harder in some ways right. to yes. kind of get, even though it's no reality whatsoever. Uh, but if they could be, too. if they could be curious about why they, you know, why do you need to have them never do this right now? If suddenly in in the presence of you and their partner, they could say, "Well, I don't feel like they're going to hear me." 
if I don't yell, I'm not right. heard. Right. And saying never is a form of yelling. Right. I really don't think. And if that were to happen, that can be powerful. Somebody can begin to say the person across from them could even, in the best case scenario, doesn't always have body mean say, I'm sorry that I've created a space where you feel like you have to yell. You're right. Sometimes I don't hear. Sometimes, and if that were to happen, boom. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a moment mm -hmm. right there. That's yeah. that's uh, when the therapy light comes yeah, on right there. Yeah. Therapy is happening in mm -hmm. that in that moment. Yeah, and for the other person to respond in that way takes some ability to kind of get away from your narcissism and be in that moment. And, and they can for the others. They need to be curious about themselves and the other in a way. They have to be able to be open to listen to what that you know, what that could mean. No, this could be an act of positive, positive hate. You know what? The op, the negative hate is um, is is non-helpful hate. For instance, you, what you find we could talk about this someday too. Yes. Because um, I remember not too long ago, we they handed out all these things we were supposed to put in our uh, offices that said, "Hate has no home here." And um, there are forms of hate that are selfful. There are forms of hate that are necessary. Racism would be negative hate. All it does is serves a uh, place for you to to put your projections and not be curious in own parts of yourself. Well, yeah, that, that, that's what I think when we first started talking about um, this idea of uh, of being selfish uh, in both the negative and the positive ways, and th this idea that it may lead to your being defensive and. Uh, anger at others and sort of outside of yeah. the the self, the peripheral um, self, if as it were, that there is um, there's some way to manage that in the and get the balance, as you said a moment ago, to sort of balance yeah. that in a way that, yeah, we're taking care of ourselves, but we're also helping and taking care of others in this, and so that helps us be in that middle mm -hmm. middle ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, and you can think of. Um, you can think of uh, uh, there's a mutuality that that's even a term that that gets thrown along around in philosophy and in uh, in feminist theory and in psychoanalysis. A mutuality is the notion that um, it's a two-way street. That um, the perfect mother-infant couple is a uh, is a moment of mutuality. It's sure the mom is taking care of the baby, but the baby's also taking care of the mom. They are two mirrors. They're 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 dancing. And maybe that's something to think about, that maybe in a selfful state, there's the potential for dancing too. I, I reach out to someone else because I help them. It helps me to help them. And it's a mutuality. Wow, that might be, yes. And, and, I mean, that, that, that seems so right in the, the way you said that. And I think I've heard many people say, and I've said it myself, that the best way to help yourself is maybe to help someone else. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that that helps t uh, back to that balance between taking care of yourself, taking care of others. And I think the best way to help me is a, a a new European sports car. You know, I was I was <laughs> I was thinking maybe it would go to that. Um, you might need to get a Tesla, my friend. I'm just thinking. thinking Tesla? Yeah, we've got to be able to. Elon uh, Musk. Uh, we we got to follow Elon along well, you know, with Porsche this thing. Porsche has a uh, has an electric car come out. It's coming out. Actually, I think it's already out. Yeah, these electric cars are so fast. Incredible. I mean, they're blowing away the gas 1. engines. 7, I mean, one point seven seconds, zero to sixty. It's literally, it's like you know, boom. I'm gonna have one of these. Oh, we gotta have one. I'm, you know, so something. I'm gonna finally happen. get that respect I deserve. If I get this car, <laughs> I will get the respect I deserve. You know, have you listened to anything that we've said today? <laughs> in this, in this, uh, in this that would be a, that would be some some narcissism. Well. Well, I, I think it can be, but you know we have to take care of ourselves through this thing. So, mm -hmm. being a little bit, all right, let's sum, let's sum this thing up just a little bit, if you will. So, we've got to figure out how to manage and how to balance this. What's mm -hmm. your advice? I asked you last time in the show this, this idea about okay, Pixar help, stock. helpful, right? Helpful, <laughs> uh, just helpful thoughts uh, based on what we talked about. Sea biscuit in the think? ninth. No, that's, no, that's, no, that's racing. No. Give me some numbers for the lotto. No, <laughs> I don't that's, that's, need that's. that. Thank you. Well, here's the thing. I think the first step is is that um, is uh, to not to, to not pathologize some of what we put under the umbrella of narcissism. That's a fancy way of saying is that right. all of us struggle and have to maintain our sense of self through some things that we're not often proud of. Because I think shame is one of the killers of curiosity. 
right. the ability to be able to take a breath and say, ah, oh, ain't that just like me? So my advice would be is that is that to to and this could be advice that we'll uh, talk about in, in in lots of times to come. How do we start the process of listening to ourselves? And to be able to do that is often to be able to forgive yourself, to allow yourself a level of complexity, to be able to say there's more of me than I know, there's parts of me that come out in situations that I wasn't prepared for, and that's okay. And I think that opens up the possibility of being you in ways that don't require some of that negative selfishness. Right. The narcissist, when they, um, again, there's a, I think I mentioned this before, but David Bowie's last album, there's one of the last songs on there, there's a lyric that he says, ain't that just like me? Ain't that just like me? And I thought that's just a wonderful way to sum up what it could be like in a moment where you can sort of be curious about what's moving inside of you and your impact on the world. Wow, ain't that just like me? And there's the possibility mm -hmm. then for it being something else. And in a broader, broader sense, um, it, it could be helpful to be in therapy. I mean, a little bit, that's like if you're talking to a car salesman, I'm going to sell you a car. But um, if not in therapy, uh, think of if you can step back and count the people who currently love you the people that you feel the best connection with. You can enter a dialogue with them. You can not only stay connected to them, but maybe they can help you to see parts of yourself too, just like you might be able to help them to see parts of themselves. But I think it requires some level of, of investment, and, and, and it, it, for most of us, I think it involves a, a certain level of bravery that's to be the, able to own parts of yourself that you... I, I was thinking that because I think Adler said that, you know, to, to fully live in your life, you have to be courageous. Mm. It takes courage to live. Mm. And, and uh, that, those, are, those are kind of interesting things. You have to allow yourself the, uh, uh, really the opportunity to make mistakes and to be okay and not be so fragile mm. and always trying to protect that narcissism or mm. be the best and the, and the fastest and so forth. Um, I think that is such a waste of time for some of the for those mm -hmm. people. Even though, in our society, it mm -hmm. seems like the 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 pushy person, the, the person that they could be president projects <laughs> themselves. <laughs> they um, could become president. They, they, <laughs> you could be president. I wasn't going exactly there, but <laughs> yeah, I think you, could, you, you, you could sort be. of summed that up uh, for us pretty well. But uh, but but it has to be regulated in some ways. Mm -hmm. And the fear of disintegration or mm -hmm. decomping, and mm -hmm. as we talk about that that idea, I think is. Um, is almost a fear. It's just mm -hmm. a, it's a, it's a basic fear mm -hmm. that you have to get over and get to the side where there is courage. We often see this in therapy. Someone will come in and they'll say, um, and um, they um, will tell you they're afraid because if they start to cry, they think the tears won't won't stop, or they start crying and they say that, but before the hour's over, the tears stop and they're in a different place, and it can be really powerful for them for them to realize wait a minute i was able to um um to go to pieces without falling apart i was able to mm -hmm. to 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 to, to in, in therapy is a safe place to do that if you have a good relationship with a therapist and you sure. feel so secure you literally can go to pieces right and that what you learn from that is you begin to build the courage you begin to be able to be aware of that just because it feels like you're going to implode that, that, that that's not necessarily the state you're going to move through. Once you're able to allow yourself to step into that space a few more, a few times at least, then it becomes easier to fall apart in all the right sort of ways. Okay. I like it. I think... Uh, and I still need one of them uh, electric um, Porsches. Yeah, you do. Um, well, we've we've got to get on your Instagram, your Facebook, Let's and the it. Twitter, and the YouTube. Can I start one of them uh, sort of <laughs> GoFundMe? Yes, you cool? can. Yes, that, you can. Uh, uh, can I go... What, what, how much do you think I get if I would say GoFundMe this um, for a... Uh, you know, just to see what would happen... Um, I chip in a dollar. <laughs> you know, I, would, I, I chip in a well, dollar. A, what if I did this? Can I say that I have some sort of disease that if I don't get enough money, I'm going to die and then buy the car with it? Can um, you do that? I don't know if that's been done before. It sounds like somebody probably has done that. But How about uh, this? I say I have... Let's come up with another idea. I have terminal narcissism, and the only way that this can be fixed is if I get a nice car. 
Okay, you want to be the first narcissist <laughs> to be uh, cured, is the word. That's right, I went like, okay. like a ham. Well, you know, that's one of those things. I mean, can you cure narcissism? I mean, some people say if you're really in that personality disorder and you've gone so far. I think you, you, you learn to modulate to and that, navigate yeah. it better. You can that's be all aware. you can do, make right. it better. I think you, you know, the... And that's probably true for most things. You look at some of the outcome studies, particularly in, I know, the psychoanalytic outcome studies. What happens is you build an awareness that allows you to be able to feel it less, to be lost in it less, to be able to name it when it happens. And there's something wonderful in that. Yeah, I think I think that's cool. Well, um, go ahead and start that fund me. I've got well, a dollar me. around here let's somewhere. And uh, let's see what we can do. And until next time, we'll stop right there. Good mm -hmm. to see you.